write it and we'll do it live. So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike your match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Barbecue Central Show. This just happens to be the show that talks about all things important in the world of barbecue and grilling. We broadcast live and direct from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio. It is the barbecue capital of the North Coast. Oh, ah, by the way, I'm your program host, Greg Rippey. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday evening. Should you see fit to get in touch with me through the channels of email via the World Wide Web, here's how you do it. Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. That's G-R-E-G. Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. Everything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, the BBQ Central Show.com. And here's what's happening in case you didn't get the newsletter coming up in about 12 minutes from now. He had, I can't, I don't remember right off the bat if it was a two-month hiatus, at least a one-month hiatus, maybe a couple more weeks than that. He is traditionally the third Tuesday of the month regular guest. He is returning to reprise that role this evening. Stephen Reichlin from the Barbecue Bible. Multiple-time author, TV show host, cooking class instructor, barbecue Hall of Fame inductee, all that good stuff. Stephen Reichlin will be back. And, of course, since we are on the precipice of one of the biggest eating holidays over the course of a calendar year, certainly 4th of July is a big holiday that we eat at, and Memorial Day and Labor Day. Christmas, if you see fit, or whatever holiday it is that you celebrate. I think that we can all agree that this coming Thursday is the American holiday. Regardless of race and color and creed and religion, we can all agree that this is America's holiday come Thursday, Thanksgiving, which I continually maintain is getting squeezed out each year a little less and a little less of Thanksgiving and a lot more of Christmas and the other holiday season events getting crammed in. For instance, Halloween ended November 1st, Christmas music, Sirius XM Radio. No less than four stations playing a variety of Christmas music. So Hold on to it as long as you can because someday Thanksgiving is going to be a mere passerby holiday, perhaps less than St. Patrick's Day or Sweetest Day. What is that? That's what people are going to be saying about Thanksgiving soon. We got to make sure we hold it dear. But anyway, we are, as I said, we are on the precipice of one of the biggest eating holidays of the year. So to help you break it down, Make sure you're doing it right. A lot of you are probably headlong into the preparations for Thursday's events anyway, especially if you got a huge-ass frozen turkey. Stephen Reichlin will help us out in that regard. Plus, we will talk in depth about his Italian TV show taping. We'll get, again, a little refresher and background on what it was supposed to be. And more importantly, how it actually went down, what he found out in the world of Italy. And barbecue, live fire, what are they doing over there that we're not doing here? How about that? Maybe somebody else is setting a trend or a standard. Are they eating pork belly burnt hens in Italy? (laughs) They're eating them all over the place here, I can tell you that. So that's Stephen Reichland. Then at 9.35, he was on a year ago, February. He was a former Sam's Club national title champion. Went through a a hellacious health battle. 
I believe, with pancreatitis, if I'm not mistaken. Jim Berg from Killer Bees Barbecue rejoins the show. Cummins, Georgia saw, I believe, a triple header event, perhaps two simultaneously on a Friday or a Saturday, and then one the following day. So three total, three different winners, Shake and Bake, one. Jim Berg won Killer Bees Barbecue. Of course, Travis Clark, you know, where he shows up. If, you, if you're giving him a best of three, it's got to be a 100% chance that he's going to pull one of the three out in terms of victory, right? He is having a season of all time. Not only his best competition, his best competition season ever, but through very trusted sources of mine. Plus it happens to be my own personal opinion because I've been tracking overall scores and how many competition teams actually do competitions during the course of the year. Without a doubt, probably the most competitions cooked statistically superior. His out of the top 10 is minuscule. He's winning a lot. And if he's not winning, he's usually taking second place. He had flashed up what his stats were because he has called it a season after this past weekend in Cummins. And it was an impressive list, I have to say. I might have that in the second hour, but not only is it an impressive competition season for Travis and the team, but perhaps, nay, I will say it, the premier competition season that Competition Barbecue has ever seen since the inception of Competition Barbecue somewhere in the 80s. So congratulations to Travis Clark. I diverged, so Jim Berg will be back on because he has finally gotten back to the mountain, gone through all of the health trials and tribulations and making sure that the cooking is still on point, working his way back in. I mean, that was the most difficult part for Jim was getting some semblance of wind back and being able to do more than a couple hours of semi-strenuous work before he was in bad shape again. So to get that win in Cummins, Georgia is absolutely magnificent, and we will talk to him about that at 9.35. Then we'll move on to the second hour. As I had said, Thanksgiving right around the corner. What if I'm reminding you right now that Thanksgiving is Thursday? Uh -oh. I got this big turkey in my freezer. What am I going to do with it? I don't know. <laughs> Never fear. Sam the cooking guy is here. We will talk about what if you fall into that small minority, small percentage of folks who have just plum forgot that you needed to defrost your turkey and maybe there's not any fresh turkeys to be had anymore or they're all spoken for or you have to go on a waiting list from the butcher in case somebody decides to shine on their fresh turkey. Who knows? But not only will we figure out at what size turkey is too late to defrost, and by the way, I think if it's anything over five pounds, you're kind of effed at the moment. However, we will decide safe ways to help you out if it's bigger than that. But perhaps more importantly, to take some of the stress off, what could you possibly make in place of turkey if you just if it's not feasible anymore? What can you do that's acceptable in place of turkey given your current situation? We will talk to Sam about that. And then at nine, I'm sorry, 1035, we will close the show out with a guy that owns a barbecue and grilling supply store in Bartlett, Tennessee, called Memphis Barbecue Supply. He is a pit master of a team that competes under the same business name, Memphis Barbecue Supply. Oh, he also happens to be a host of a podcast barbecue style of his own called The Rub. Jimmy Shotwell will be first timing right here on this show at 1035. And we will talk about uh, perhaps some Thanksgiving stuff going on with Jimmy. Good to know a little bit about him as well since he's on for the first time. But he was taking part in the World Food Championships a couple weeks ago. And we will talk to him about his experience there. And we will also hear his take or his position on why the Barbecue Hall of Fame should move to none other than Memphis, Tennessee, one of the barbecue meccas. Uh, many would argue that the Barbecue Hall of Fame is currently in a barbecue mecca, that being Kansas City. It's not in the Carolinas. It's not anywhere in Texas. It's not Memphis. It is in Kansas, Missouri, wherever the hell it is, Kansas City. You choose which state because guess what? 
Two of them are there. Missouri, Kansas. Missouri, Kansas. He says, forget about that. Fight over those states if you want. Bring it to Memphis. We will hear why his potentially biased opinion is worth consideration. So there you have it. Stephen Reichland coming up out of the break. Jim Berg after that. Sam the Cooking Guy at 1014. And first timer to the show, Jimmy Shotwell will help me close it out this evening. 216. Sorry, Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com is your email address. Folks, if you're looking to turn up the heat this winter in regards to your barbecue skills, you're going to need to get your hands on the most advanced ceramic cooker and high tech barbecue accessory to hit the market. I'm talking about the all new Monolith Barbecue at Guru Edition and CyberQ Cloud Controller. Just launched by Barbecue Guru earlier this year, it's the world's first temperature-controlled ceramic smoker and grill. With a built-in power draft fan, it's going to give you the easiest and most successful barbecue experience you've ever had. These must-have new products will make barbecuing easier than ever before and will be your new secret weapon for cooking delicious barbecue each and every time. What do you hear from the best pitmasters that travel the country doing these competitions? Consistency is the key. Consistency is the key. This will help you do it each and every time. So if you are ready to buy, might I encourage you to head over to the website, bbqguru.com. That's bbqguru.com. And grab them up while they last. They are trying to keep stock orders aplenty. So nobody has to go without during this holiday season. If you have any questions about what to order, call them directly, okay? 800 288 G-U-R-U, that's 800-288-GURU. And again, you can visit the website, bbqguru.com. If you have any questions, do not guess, okay? Big purchase, don't guess, 800-288-GURU. They will answer your questions. And you might be asking yourself, hey, Greg, I have a Guru temperature controller already. Better news for you, get the cooker and then just attach the controller right to the fan that's already built in. Away you go. Hook up your pit temp probes, your internal meat temperatures, set your whole parameter. You're off and running. It doesn't get any easier than that. So if you have a controller already, you can hook it up right to the fan on the monolith. BBQGuru.com, 800-288-GURU. The Barbecue Guru continues to be a breakthrough in barbecue technology. We're back with Stephen Reichlin right after this. Stick around. Be right back. Live from the Barbecue Central Radio Network Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. All right, welcome back. The 2018 grant program from Smithfield, as I've been saying here over the last couple weeks, is officially closed. So, too bad for you if you didn't get it. Well over 250 applications were taken. Huge response. More to come on that as it's released from Smithfield to me. However, I can tell you this. The 2018 Committed Cooks program is getting ready to jump off here in just a few short weeks. So keep visiting the website, smokinwithsmithfield.com. That's smokin, S-M-O-K-I-N, smokinwithsmithfield.com for all the details. It's going to be great. Check it out and get you more information as we get it. All right, my first guest, seen every third Tuesday of the month here on this show, a 25, uh, 25, 2015 Barbecue Hall of Fame inductee, TV show host, barbecue cooking class instructor, multiple time offer, dare I say, uh, world traveler, Stephen Reichland, joining us here on the show. Hey, Stephen, how are you, buddy? Doing great. How about yourself? Absolutely fabulous, Stephen. Appreciate you making time here. And, you know, the last time we talked, I think we've, uh, at least missed one visit, uh, potentially two, but uh, when we had talked the last time, you were discussing or kind of pulling back the curtain as you were getting ready to head on over to Italy and tape a whole new style TV show. So 
if we could just back it up just for a few short minutes here and you can give us that background again on what the TV show idea is, and then we can dig a little bit more into how it actually went down for you. Uh, well, that sounds great. So the show is called Stephen Reichland Grills Italy. Uh, it, um, it's a show where I uh, travel around Italy discovering how Italians grill. And uh, then we uh, rented a castle in Tuscany, and, uh, and I show my versions, uh, my takes of what I saw in Italy. So, for example, uh, in Florence, uh, we went to the great uh, Florentine steakhouse, uh, Bucalapi. Uh, we watched how a traditional Florentine beefsteak a la Fiorentina is cooked. Uh, then when it came to my turn to show how I grill Italy, I actually did a beefsteak a la Fiorentina caveman style with a bell pepper hash uh, that was also uh, roasted uh, in a skillet on the embers and uh, poured it on top. You can imagine that eyes popped and jaws dropped because no Italian has <laughs> ever seen anyone place a steak directly on the embers. But uh, it was an amazing experience, one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. Uh, we did 10 locations in northern Italy, including Venice, including Florence, uh, Pisa. We were up in, the, uh, up in the mountains, the Dolomite Mountains near the Austrian border where we did some amazing wild game. Uh, it's part travel show, it's a part documentary about how Italians grill, and then, of course, it's a part, uh, part sort of Stephen Reichlin, Project Smoke, Project Fire, my interpretations of Italian grilling. Is it a physically and mentally draining project for you, Stephen, or have you done enough of this kind of stuff to where you've built up that stamina and that mindset and you're not kind of overcome with all these new places and new ideas and new concepts? You know, on the contrary, I found that uh, because of the new format and traveling around Italy, meeting new uh, people and discovering new places, it was extremely uh, invigorating. Um, the part that was tiring is uh, I've been studying Italian for the last six months trying to prepare for the show. Uh, so being with a crew that speaks very fast Italian all the time was, you know, <laughs> that part was tiring. Stephen Reichlin joining me here on the show, barbecuebible.com, the website, of course. Uh, so, Stephen, is there a broad or all-encompassing Italian grilling or live fire style that you could put a finger on? Well, there is, and it's uh, characterized by ut the utmost simplicity. It's really a cuisine that's all about uh, the quality of the raw materials, the seasonality of the raw materials, and seasonings are kept to a bare minimum. I mean, I like to joke, you know, what is Italian grilling? It's uh, meat plus salt plus olive oil plus fire. <laughs> meat, salt, olive oil, fire. Occasionally, if they get daring, they add a squeeze of lemon juice. Uh, so for me... Um, you know, as a, as a food writer, because there will be a book about this experience too, um, it's pretty simple-minded. It's pretty simple-minded grilling. Of course, you know, the seafood you get, I mean, the live eels that we caught in the north of the Venetian Lagoon, the, uh, the seafood that we found in Portofino, uh, the deer we had up in the Dolomite Mountains, just extraordinarily flavorful, but very simple. And I think what I brought as an American griller is, you know, we love big flavors. We love multiple layers of flavor. We use a lot of spices, sauces. We start with a rub. We add a glaze. We might finish with a barbecue sauce. So I think it's that layering of flavor that I brought to Italy. Stephen, is there a favorite style of cooker that they use, or are they open-style fire pits that you would find in the backyards like in the 40s and 50s? What are they cooking on over there? Well, I would say in general you're talking about direct grilling rather than indirect grilling or uh, smoking. Um, pretty simple, uh, typically done over uh, charcoal, sometimes over wood, although there were some very uh, intriguing uh, traditional methods. Uh, one chef, um, Max Massimo Spigarello, uh, actually did a dish where he made, he took clay from the Po River, mixed it with flour, and eggs to make a dough, and then he wrapped a pork shoulder and he wrapped potatoes in this black mud, 
and roasted them in a 500-year-old wood-burning oven. Uh, you know, flavor spectacular. The the high drama just uh, completely off the charts. Um, so there are traditional methods that are interesting. There's a, a traditional grill called a fogelar that is used in the uh, Veneto region of Italy. It's a raised indoor fireplace with an onion-shaped dome that you actually find in the middle of a dining room, both in a private home and a restaurant. Um, people grill on that. People grill all year round in Italy. A lot of grilling is done in fireplaces. A lot of it's done in the uh, autumn and winter. Um, so, you know, there was a lot for me to learn, too. Do you find that the Italian culture is one more based in seasonality eating in regards to ingredients that it has access to versus something over here you would see in the States? Oh, absolutely. They are completely governed by seasonality. Mm -hmm. uh, seasonality in the produce, season. I remember uh, when we were doing the, uh, the cooking segments with me at this castle in, uh, in Tuscany, and uh, one of the kitchen prep people came, uh, came up with some... Uh, uh, Mantuan uh, pumpkin, which had just come in season that week. And, I mean, everybody was totally passionate, freaked out that this pumpkin, which people wait in Italy for all year, was finally in season. Uh, the same with uh, a special kind of uh, radicchio that, uh, that's only found in the fall. Uh, seasonal seafood. When we are in Venice, we got what are called uh, canaliki, these baby razor clams that are maybe the size of your uh, your baby finger. They're tiny. They're supernaturally sweet. Moleki, uh, these postage stamp size uh, soft shell crabs. Uh, and I'm sure when we when I go back in the spring, I you know I hope we're going to do a second season. Uh, there'll be a whole different set of foods to grill uh, in the spring. Is there something? that would be akin to a fad or something that's really popular that's happening over in Italy right now that isn't happening here? Um, I would not say Italians are prone to faddishness. Um, on the contrary, I mean, I think I brought some tech American techniques that uh, Italians really don't do very much. Uh, cedar planking, for example. I did uh, cedar plank bronzino, which was fantastic. Or grilling on a salt slab. Uh, that was something they had never seen before. And I did I'm ready cookie stuff pears uh, grilled on a salt slab. Uh, in terms of... Um, in terms of what they can teach us, you know, I think the, the emphasis on the pristine, the quality of the ingredients. Uh, if it isn't fresh, they don't grill it. If it isn't seasonal, seasonal, they don't grill it. You know, it's not about finding strawberries in January, you know, that are flown in from Argentina. What's the, I hate to use the word weird, but uh, I, I'm not a great wordsmith. What's the weirdest thing that you had to try during your time? Um, uh, uh, not weird in terms of its popularity, but uh, the day we did eel in a town called Corogoro, and there was an amazing restaurant that specializes in grilled eel, uh, I went out on a fishing boat. Uh, we fished eel. We brought it back. We, uh, you, you basically, you, uh, you butcher it alive, and you cut it into pieces, and because of its highly developed uh, nervous system, autonomous nervous system, the pieces are still moving and wriggling uh, while you're attempting to grill them, uh, although the eel has been decapitated and got it dispatched. So um, I think that was maybe a little dis uh, disconcerting. Uh, in terms of what they saw that was weird, uh, I think when I made a pizza crust and draped the dough directly on the grill grate and grilled the pizza not even on a stone but right on the, right over the fire, that that blew minds. I can't wait to see that episode. Is, is there any chance that we're going to be able to see that over in the States or that will only be Italian oh, yeah. driven? Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, our plan is really to take this show worldwide. So oh, uh, I have every every hope that it will air in the United States, too. Stephen Reichlin joining us here on the show. BarbecueBible.com is his website. Stephen, obviously, two days from now, we have uh, you know what I've called the, one of the bigger eating holidays. I think kind of all holidays are big eating events, but certainly no other one, uh, aside from maybe a couple summer ones, really drive the food is uh, center stage, of course, that being Thanksgiving. 
And so let's talk about the best way to have a big holiday feast without getting lost in the mix, because I think that is something that a lot of folks get lost in. They invite everybody over and all of a sudden they feel the pressure that they have to be able to pull this thing off all by themselves and then havoc ensues. And if you're able to pull it off, you're really not a happy customer having shouldered the burden. Yeah, well, um, you know, divide and conquer is one way to approach it. I mean, encourage people who are coming over to uh, help you out with the side dishes. Uh, Turk, that's, you know, that's what we do in my family. Uh, our daughter does a lot of the side dishes. Um, the, uh, the turkey always falls to me. I always do it differently every year. Uh, last year, we, uh, we did a bourbon brine, which is fantastic. Um, this year, we're going to do a technique that I showed on the uh, Project Smoke 3 TV show. That is uh, going to loosen the skin from the turkey, stuff herb butter under the skin, and then truffles, those aromatic uh, uh, subterranean fungi. Uh, we get our truffles from uh, Oregon and Washington State, a little dif different than the European truffle. You can't find a truffle whole sage leaves under the skin. Uh, so as the turkey uh, roasts, and it's either a spit roast or an indirect grill, that butter melts. It melts right into the flesh, so you never have a dry turkey breast. Um, I also uh, like to use an injector sauce. Mine is equal parts melted butter and homemade chicken or turkey stock with a little cognac uh, added. Uh, so, um, you know, it's a uniquely American holiday. Uh, Oysters are always a part of our Thanksgiving, uh, either grilled on the half shell or added to uh, added to the dressing. Uh, oysters were definitely on the menu when the Pilgrims had their first Thanksgiving dinner. Are you a big believer or non-believer of stuffing the stuffing in the turkey? I never stuff the stuffing in the turkey. Uh, first of all, I mean, I think it does an injustice to the uh, stuffing. It becomes soggy, and I like a crisp crust on my stuffing. Uh, second of all, you know, it just, I think a turkey roasts better, any bird roasts better when the cavity is empty. And uh, finally, there, you know, there are all sorts of food safety issues if you don't handle the bird properly, keep it at the right temperature. And uh, those are complicated when you put a, attempt to cook a stuffing in the cavity. In regards to that food safety, what temperature do you like to get the bird to? I've been seeing a whole bunch of different numbers here over the internet the last number of days. Some saying, hey, take it to 154, keep it there to at 154 for so many minutes and then pull it off. This will give you a more juicy bird overall. And it's, uh, as he would, as this person was saying, it's a time and temperature both together. What are your recommendations in that regard? Well, I uh, advocate cooking a turkey to at least 165 degrees, which is the USDA recommended minimum. But actually, I go a bit over. Uh, I I tend to uh, like my poultry medium well. And I think what happens when you cook it higher than that uh, is it, it comes out more tender. It's, uh, it's sort of on the way to being able to pull it. Uh, and because you've either brined your bird or you've placed butter under the uh, – under the skin and injected it, you don't need to worry about the breast um, uh, drying out. But I think you get a more uh, a more tender bird at a higher temperature. This year, are you hearing of any new Thanksgiving trends that we haven't seen in years past or anything like this? Uh, let's see. Well, um, you know, for me, Thanksgiving is the time actually to be traditional. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really looking for trends, but uh, one thing I know we'll be doing is a salt slab squash where you uh, you roast squash halves, acorn squash halves, on a salt slab and then stuff them. Uh, cranberry, you know, uh, cranberry is always a part of my holiday experience. Uh, this year I'm going to be doing it as a salsa rather than as a sauce. So you play the acidity. I'll add some jalapeno chili, some lime juice, some cilantro. So you'll kind of bring in those southwestern flavors. Um, pumpkin pie, yeah, you can cook it on the grill, indirect grilling with a little wood smoke. Smoke always tends to make things taste a little bit more succulent. Um, another technique uh, that I've done that's really interesting is you can caveman a pumpkin. You know, you lay a whole pumpkin right on the embers, mm. roast it on the embers until the skin is charred black, 
and then you take that flesh and you use it for your pumpkin pie, and that that gives you an amazing smoky flavor and consistency. Stephen, right after everybody's done with Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas starts, sales are going to go off. Of course, that means people are out holiday shopping for Christmas or whatever holiday season they celebrate. So the question always comes probably to you at the, around this time is, hey, I'm looking into a new grill or a new smoker. What advice do you have for me on how I should go about getting my next pit or a grill? Well, um, one piece that you should think about, uh, I mean, just one general bit of advice is always buy more grill or smoker than you think you need because you'll grow into it. Mm -hmm. And I find that uh, a little bit more of investment up front, even if it means tightening your belt, will pay off in the long time uh, going with quality uh, over, uh, over just price. Uh, I mean, it's such a huge topic, you know, starting with, do you want a grill or a smoker, right? Because they're two very different processes. I think the answer is both, but, you know, you need to sequence it in a way that matches your, uh, your pocketbook. Stephen Reichlin joins us on the third Tuesday of every month, and he is safely back from Italy where uh, in the spring, hopefully a, a different season or a new season uh, is inviting him to come back over there and uh, do it up. In the meantime, as we hear more about this particular show and if it's going to get thrown over here into the States, certainly you can pass it down to me, Stephen. I'll let all the Centralites know. Uh, what else do you have happening here during the holiday season? Well, I'm uh, actually pretty busy putting my next book to, to bed. Uh, that book is called Project Fire, and it's the uh, sequel to Project Smoke. It's a book about grilling with an emphasis on some of the uh, revolutionary new techniques that people are bringing to grilling. Um, it's, uh, it will be out this spring. Uh, it's uh, for those of you who are, have written books or thinking about writing books, it's at the galley stage, which means that the type has been set, the pages have been laid out with the photography, and you're, uh, I'm kind of reviewing pretty much what looks like the, what will become the final book. But it's an opportunity to trim text so it fits the right space to do uh, uh, one final check to make sure all of the uh, all of the advice is consistent, uh, rearrange photographs as needed. Uh, and I will be touring in uh, May and uh, May and June again next year. It seems like uh, those two months I'm always <laughs> on tour. Uh, we're working on another season, actually the first season of the Project Fire TV show. Project Smoke will morph into Project Fire. <laughs> Uh, let's see, my new uh, Project Smoke uh, barbecue rubs are uh, are coming up on their first holiday season, and then the Project Smoke uh, barbecue sauces will be out just after the first of the year. So a lot going on in Reichland world. He's a busy guy, Stephen Reichland. Again, the third Tuesday of every month right here on this show. Always appreciate the time, Stephen. Thanks so much. Always a pleasure. Happy uh, holiday to you, uh uh, Craig and Greg and uh, to all your listeners. All right. Thanks again, Stephen. There he is, the guy that does the barbecue Bible oh, yes, stuff. on the yeah. Barbecue Central show. Barbecue Hall of Famer. The Smithfield Hotline. Yummy. Barbecue Hall of Famer if you need him. Let me get this right. The eels, because of their autonomous nervous system, after you cut them and put them on the grill, still be squirreling around. That is a little disconcerting. I believe you said disconcerting, too. Hey, folks, uh, if you're looking for, uh, speaking of if you're looking for a new smoker, how about Cook Shack? They manufacture smoker ovens for barbecue lovers with any amount of experience, like me a number of years ago, just a noob, or a backyard moderator, an expert, beginner, maybe you're on the competition circuit, maybe you cook in a five-star dining facility. Cook Shack has the unit that will do the job, and with a full line of barbecue sauces, spices, pellets, and wood chunks, it's the perfect one-stop shop. Cook Shack strives to be your barbecue resource center by offering cooking classes, online recipes, how-to videos, two blogs, smoke and grilling 101s, and a video cooking classroom. Check out their website at cookshack.com or follow them on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, Google+. Get advice or share your passion for barbecue on their world-class barbecue forum. Cook Shack pellet-fired smokers are the choice of champions because they were designed by a champion, Ed Fast, Eddie Morin. The FEC 100, PG 1000, always customer favorites. The PG 1000 can actually double as a smoker and a grill. 
Low and slow, hot and fast, the pellet grill line gives you the most for your money. And don't forget, the Cook Shack Residential Electric Smokers are the number one smoker in the industry. High quality means high durability and versatility. Anything you can cook in your oven, you can make in a Cook Shack. That's just it. Passion and dedication drives Cook Shack's manufacturing, with quality always being at the forefront. Get the best in barbecue since 1962. Call 800 423 0698 that's 800-423-0698 or again visit the website at cookshack.com jim berg from killer bees coming up out of the break stick around we'll be right back Now, let's get back to the LeBron James and Barbecue Talk. Craig Rampey. Thanks again to Stephen Reichland for joining me last segment. This portion of the show being brought to you by Green Mountain Grills, manufacturers of some of the best pellet cookers out there on the market today. If you're looking for a big cooker to house a lot of food, like for this coming Thanksgiving, they got one for you. Medium size, got you covered there too with the Jim uh, Daniel Boone. Something small to take on tailgates? Yes, the Davy Crockett. They can also supply you with pellets to fire those cookers. And don't forget the pizza insert for the Jim Bowie and the Daniel Boone as well. I love my Green Mountain Grill. You could love yours too if you visit the website, greenmountaingrill.com. All right, my guest, uh, my next guest is a very successful competition barbecue cook. Killer Bees barbecue team won the 2014 Sam's Club national title. That year, they also won the Georgia barbecue team of the year title. Then, of course, there was that well-documented illness that almost took my next guest's life. If you go back to the February 23rd episode in 2016, you can get the full backstory on that. But this past weekend in Cummins, Georgia, the road back to Grand Champion was realized. Here to recap the weekend is the pitmaster of the Killer Bees barbecue team. None other than Jim Burr joining me here on the show. Jim, how are you, buddy? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Greg? I'm doing absolutely fabulous, Jim. Appreciate you making time and joining the show this evening. So good times are here again as it relates to the competition success, Jim. So let's talk about the weekend and the win. This, of course, unlike most contests, because it was like a, a triple event. You had two going off simultaneously, I believe. Then you had one the following day. Am I getting all of that timeline down where they're two in one day and one the following day? It wasn't as bad as what people would think it is. I really actually lo like really doing that double in one day uh, because you're already cooking. You just throw it. If you got a little bit more room on your smoker, you can go ahead and cook the meat and you plate them up side by side. Uh, it lets you know about the judging and stuff because you're cooking the meat side by side, same flavor profile, same timeline, same everything. So you can kind of see how judging is either going to be inconsistent or consistent. And, uh, in my cook, I found out both. We just did the double on Saturday. Uh, with my, you know, with my health issues and stuff, I didn't want to push it to Sunday. So we did the double on Saturday, and we actually really, I'd rather do a double on Saturday than have to do one Saturday and one Sunday, my opinion. Travis Clark but, wins. Uh, Travis Clark won one. You won one as far as the, the first day is concerned. Right. And, you know, Travis had Rod Gray helping him cook, and he brought his jambos. He was kind of cooking on two different pits, uh, even though they're both jambos. You know, we cooked everything on our one deep south. And, uh, I mean, performed flawlessly. Most people had one pit there. You know, some people use a cook on, you know, one or two pits, you know, or three pits, depending on what, you know, what they're cooking. 
But most of the people I talked to agreed that they'd rather do a double on a Saturday because then they get home to their family on Sunday. And uh, but it went over very well. The reps, Kathy and Philip Brazier and the cooks, um, they did a fantastic job taking the meat in, getting it all judged, having the scoring done correctly. And I mean, really, truthfully, from my standpoint. I did not see any hiccups whatsoever. It was a very well-run contest. You know, it's not Randall's first rodeo, but in this, you know, area doing that double on Saturday, mm -hmm. they didn't really know what to expect. And we talked to Philip and Kathy afterwards. We ate dinner with them. Uh, we were on the way out of town. They just happened to be at the same restaurant we were going to eat at. And uh, they said even though it was a little bit more work on Saturday, that everything just kind of ran and flowed, you know, really well. Uh, it was like two separate contests in one, but it was uh, it was definitely something to look at. And I think any future contests that want to do a double, I think you'd probably get more teams if you did a double in one day. So you know, were turn in times day. exactly the same? You were just you know you were turning in two yep. brisket entries and two pork entries and two rib entries, so on. Yep, it was that, exactly at the same time. So you know, in most people, chicken ribs and brisket, it takes about two or three minutes to build a box. You know, uh, pork is a little bit more detailed, depending on what you put in there. But other than that, we weren't really stressed for time. We just started about four or five minutes earlier uh, just to make sure we hit our marks in case there's any hiccups in that. But, you know, everything went it went pretty well. I mean, there's, there's like ribs. You know, we were done like a little early. I said, well, let's go ahead and walk down and turn in because I like to turn in on the, you know, on the hour to half hour is when I send Jan out, out the door. That way she's got five minutes, she doesn't run. We're usually not the first ones on the table, but we're not the last ones either. So that's been our motto is, you know, my thing was never make her run. Last year, the first contest we did, it was at SBN in South Carolina, she made me run. So anyway, uh, but it, it, it I'm, I'm telling you, Greg, it, it worked flawlessly. I mean, I don't know if every contest runs that smooth, but that one up there, Randall's been some, Audie Bragg was up there. I mean, it ran about as smooth as any contest I've ever been to. Do you have to cook more than double the amount of meat? Because, you know, typically when I'm talking to a pit master just doing the single competition, they might cook two briskets to pull a turn in from, or they might cook three pork butts to get one turn in, so on and so forth with the other remaining meats. Do you have to cook a more massive amount of food or, and I hate to say this, but are you just keeping more of a keen eye on what you have so you're not going over in any one meat category? Well, we, we, we typically, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of my students know, we typically cook, uh, you know, we're between 12 and 20 thighs of legs, depending on which ones we turn in. We usually cook four X ribs. This time we cook six, which was not that big of a deal. Uh, we always cook four pork butts, so that wasn't an issue. And then you know, we cook one or two briskets. I always cook one brisket in a contest. So... Having that being said, you know, a lot of people were finding out that they almost had like, you know, two separate cooks. They put, a lot of people put their best in group A and the bet, and then, you know, whatever they didn't really want to turn in group A, turn in group B. Come out to find out later that, you know, the B contest, they scored better than they did in A contest, which was kind of surprising in a way, but not surprising in a way also. Because I always tell people, they say, how would you cook? I say, well, I was lost with better and won with worse. <laughs> so, and that's my motto. I mean, when I think I have a damn good cook, you know, we don't score that well. When I say, oh, we had a so-so cook, we do well. Well, this weekend, we had two, not our best cooks, but they weren't bad. Our ribs, all six racks of ribs, which never happens, came out perfect. I mean, dead perfect. Hick Hickory Prime was a, was a student of mine. He got first in ribs in A contest. We took first in Riz and B contest, and Heather Senior from Crimson Q, uh, student of mine, she took first in Riz with a 180 in the third contest. So the Riz are banging up there. <laughs> I mean, and, but we scored, we were 27th in the first contest with the same Riz, and we had first in the second contest. Well, that's just it. So when, when you talk about where the frustration could potentially lie in, let's call it, a contest. Overall, you finish 16th. You know, that's really good considering you're, you know, up against 60 other teams or maybe just shy of 60 other teams. And then, so you're turning yeah. in the same stuff. In one contest, it's 16th place. In the second contest, it's first place. How do you go from 16 to first or 1 to 16? 
Well, like I said in the beginning, you know, the um, you know, I think Randall's subliminal message in this whole thing was to see as far as the judging if KCBS does have a problem. Number one, number two, how big of a problem if it if they do have one, mm -hmm. or is it just everybody you know kind of bitching and moaning about it? Well, in my cook, I don't know about everybody else's, but in my cook, uh, there was some inconsistencies in two in two categories, and there was consistency in the other two. Take brisket for example. We got seven and eleven. Yeah. All right. In pork, we got twenty fifth and thirtieth. We're within a point of one another. Now, ribs, we were eight points off, and in mm -hmm. chicken, we were 13th and 41st. Oh. So, yeah. So, there you go. There, there's some inconsistencies, but then there's some consistency. So, uh, in my cook, anyway, you look at Travis Clark. He got two 180s in brisket and mm -hmm. thir two-thirds and a second in brisket. His brisket was very consistent. I think the bigger meats, in my opinion, were a little bit more consistent than the smaller meats. But then you get to Motley Crew, who had two first place chickens, you know. So, you know, like I said, there's some inconsistencies and there's some consistencies, and I think it just depends on the the flavor of the judge and take that day. Uh, Jim, as they're so, uh, as they're getting through calls, um, are they just kind of back rolling contest A and then immediately going into awards for contest B? Do what now? You were breaking up a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When they were calling out awards, were they doing contest A first and then immediately going to contest B awards, or do they have time in between? No, they went straight from contest A. They called out, you know, everybody, and then they called out the Grand Reserve, and there was just a slight pause. They got the papers up there, and you know, because trying to get people out of there so they can get cooking again, you know. Mm -hmm. And so they went to contest B, and. It was kind of amazing because, you know, everybody knows what all I've been through and everything over the last couple of years. And this was only our 10th contest this year. We, we've only cooked one time since July. So, you know, we're up there to see friends, you know, Rod Gray, Travis Clark, all them guys were up there, Rocky Top. I mean, all these guys that, you know, really good friends of mine. Rod Gray's my mentor. Uh, for them to all be up there was just great. And, of course, you know, it was a great field up there with everybody going for points. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a what I call a legit competition up there, and you know it. Um, it was just nice because Randall, Kathy Brazier was doing the scoring, and nobody knew what was going on. So, you know, we had a first and a seventh. There were several other teams with two calls, and so nobody knew. They didn't even know until Kathy put in the last scoring and saw where I was at. Well, she got another lady to do it, another person to do it. Well, they all came up with the same <laughs> scenario. So she called Philip in there, and they all had tears in their eyes. And they said, this is something that you don't really see in barbecue. So they called Randall in there, and Randall, of course, he had to get out of there because he was going to cry. But none of them came by to see us after judging. You know, nobody could look <laughs> at us or anything. So, in which we didn't know, but in between the two, you know, when they were calling out reserve in the second contest, contest B, they went straight to reserve and they called, you know, the mutts out. And, you know, they're really good friends of ours. They helped us out a lot. Great people. And uh, there was this pause, and John Hale, the announcer, who we know, was up there, you know, talking about, well, you know, you meet some people in barbecue and everything, kind of touch you, and, you know, and went on with this long little thing. There was a pause. And Randall told John, so you fix and see something you don't ever see in barbecue. He said, this is this is something that's going to be special. So he said, take your time. So he did when they called us out. I mean, it reminded me of the Sam's Club in 2013. Everybody came up and hugged us. I mean, I had six foot six guys, Luke Dornell, they were all crying. I mean, Luke has been a, a big supporter of us through all this, a great friend of ours, and, I mean, you know, he's a world food champion. I mean, you see all these people, and it's just heartfelt. Everybody was crying. Everybody was hugging. I mean, it was – and Randall said, it's something you don't see in barbecue, you know. We had one of our friends had his dad there, and when we won, everybody, you know, they were standing ovation hugging. And he goes, why are they clapping so much for them and hugging them and stuff? <laughs> and he said, well, I'll tell you later. And he told him the whole story later on. He goes, well, hell, if I'd known that, I would have stood up and hugged for him too, you know. <laughs> so it was really great just to have everybody there, um, a lot of people that supported us. I mean, there were several teams that I need to thank, like Redneck Scientific, uh, Scully's, 
uh, Smokehouse Mafia, Sauce, all these guys in Q Pine Nation, they know who they are, put on a big benefit for, for us. Uh, Chuck Piercy uh, spearheaded the thing, raised a lot of money. I was in the hospital. I didn't know if I was going to live or die at that point. Uh, you got Rub from Swamp Boys and Hot With Chewers and Jim Elson, all the guys in Florida doing stuff, Bull Rush, uh, you know, Tuffy and Myron and, and Rod was donating stuff. I mean, people from all over the country. Uh, and one of our big supporters was Butt Rub, Byron Chisholm. Mm -hmm. Great guy. He didn't want any acknowledgement of it, but I'm giving him some kudos. I got to see him this week and everything. He's been a big supporter helping us out and everything. So, I mean, we have to thank the whole barbecue community because, like I said, without them, I wouldn't be here. And I'm dead serious. I was, you go into something when I went through and you had the depression I went through, but with my wife pushing me and the love and support from her and my family plus the barbecue family, I'm like, well, you know, I'm just too stubborn to go. But uh, it's been really thrill this year. It really has. And you know, this win just kept off. You know, we had a wedding anniversary yesterday, so it's just a whirlwind weekend, so to speak. And it was just great sharing it with everybody. You do the 10 events and, this year, uh, as you said. When you get the grand yeah. championship over, you know, the likes of a Travis Clark and, you know, all these great teams that are there, as you said, this was certainly a legit competition. Does it – kind of solidify the fact that even though you've gone through all of these things and you've kind of reclimbed this mountain, you get back to the top, that you still have the cooking chops and that you're still able to put your best on the table and compete with anybody else in the country. Yeah, I think so. You know, we've had, we've actually, in our opinion, have had some better cooks and just been, you know, hammered by the judges. And we didn't know, you know, with me not cooking as much or whatever, uh, if the flavor profiles have changed or the tenderness or whatever, and we start off the year really good, and a guy's closest to a grand you can win without winning it. We tied in uh, Boss Hog uh, for grand champion and lost the coin toss. I mean, you can't get any closer to that to winning grand than not winning it. <laughs> right. But, but, you know, and then from then on, it was just we were just getting killed, and my work started picking up. I couldn't, you know, put the effort I needed to because, you know, it's a, it's a week-long thing to get ready for these contests. And I couldn't put the effort in, and I couldn't do my work at a contest while I'm trying to trim meat and all this other stuff. So it uh, it just got a little much on me, and I told Jan then, and she agreed that you know, I'm just going to step back from barbecue for a little while, you know, concentrate on the business for a little while, and then we'll get back and do some. And, you know, Randall Bowman support, you know, he builds our deep south smokers, and, you know, everybody's got the argument on which is the best smoker, but, you know, we hung with the jambos and everything else out there. So, I mean, we, we felt like we had a really good product. And uh, But, you know, it's, it, it does feel really good to win on a stage like that because what people don't realize is that contest this weekend, a team there, between all the teams there, they won everything you could possibly win mm -hmm. in barbecue. Mm -hmm. You had American Royal winners. You had Sam's Club winners. You had Jack Daniels winners. You had several state and uh, – you know, um, regional winners. Teams of the years. You, know, you had you, you had three team of the years there. I mean, you had people going first in points, going for more points there in just about every category. You know, you had top teams in the country. Shake and Bake was there. All these guys, um, you know, you had Heath Riles, the NBM team of the year for the last three years. I mean, all these guys in one in one big competition – I think I counted there may have been maybe there were 62 teams up there. I think maybe 12 or 15 hadn't won a grand yet. The rest of them had. I mean, you got 40-plus teams that's won grand. I mean, and most of those are multiple grands. I mean, that's just that's just impressive. I mean, it really is. And it's a, it's a tough field when you get that many good cooks. And another thing that was surprising was the judges that we know come around at the contest and we always ask them well, how was the food and they say well I had some good some bad some so so talked to seven different judges and every one of them said it's the best food I had at a contest yet <laughs> then, you, then you know everybody's bringing it right there yeah you know everybody's bringing it then you're thinking oh crap you know <laughs> they didn't have my food it must have sucked or something but you know but every one of them said they had really good food and it, to me I think that's almost the first you know, usually you say, well, you know, 80% was good, some of it was so-so, but every one of them said everything they had was good, that it was really tough judging. 
And uh, but like I said, kudos for Randall and his team to pull that off. And I'm really hoping you'll see more of those doubles. Back, I really do. Back on top, yeah. uh, Jim Berg, pitmaster of Killer Bees Barbecue. Him and his wife Jan. Jim, really appreciate catching up here this evening and continued success, my friend. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Thanks for having me on there. And you know, like I tell everybody, I said, you know you're somebody when you get on your show. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> there he is, Jim Berg, everybody. That's right. No doubt about it. He is back on Four top. on the Barbecue That's Central Show will appear via the there Smithfield we Hotline. There you go. Yummy. Great guy. Uh, I, I would say great story, except for the fact that I would like to say that I wish that story had never happened. <laughs> However... It happened, they got through it, and uh, now getting more and more back into the competition scene, culminating in the Grand Championship this past weekend in Cummins, Georgia. So congratulations to Jim and Jan again on the big win over some serious stiff company. All right, let me talk to you quickly about the pit barrel cooker. All right? I had Noah Glanville on the show last week. Of course, we usually talk about the flagship product, the traditional pit barrel cooker. It's $299. It comes fully assembled. It's ready to cook on, ships free, right to your door. Well, if you haven't heard the podcast last week and you didn't show up for the live show, A, shame on you. B, they introduced a brand new product. The Pit Barrel Junior is here. It's a 16-gallon, so a little less than half. You can still get eight racks of ribs on there, I believe he's Noah said. So if you want a little bit of a smaller footprint, you want something that's a little bit more easy to take on camping trips or to tailgates, the football games, or whatever you have going on. Maybe just like a local travel caterer person. You want to have something that has really good capacity, which all pit barrels are known for. But the price point has to be right, too. Both of them, sub 300 bucks. Doesn't get any better than that. And again, it all ships for free right to your door. Hey, we're barbecue people. We love accessories. Don't worry. The Pit Barrel is coming out with a bunch of great new accessories for you to take advantage of. You have the turkey hanger. You have the pit grips. You have a coffee mug that looks like a little Pit Barrel. Beer koozies that look like little Pit Barrels as well. A lot of thought and ingenuity into this stuff. But not just throwing crap out there. Really thinking through the accoutrements, and what is going to give you value if you buy it. Like, for instance, the beer bottle opener. You can actually put that on the side of your pit barrel cooker if you want, or you don't have to. I told Noah, no way I'm drilling into my pit barrel. Except once when I put on the lid hinge, but that's it. No bottle opener. But you can if you want. They have uh, NFL licensed products as well. G uh, great new pit barrel cover. A lot of great stuff. Head on over to the website, pitbarrelcooker.com. That's pitbarrelcooker.com. See what everybody's talking about. See why Amazing Ribs has put them in their gold division four years in a row. Pitbarrelcooker.com or call 502-228-1222. We'll be back right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. I just said that. Big name interviews, advice on cooking brisket and ribs, and the only host willing to share his honest opinion on all things important in the world of barbecue. It's the Barbecue Central Show. Okay, welcome back. This will be a short one. Ran a little long with Jim Berg, but I allowed myself some space just in case. It's a big deal getting back to the winning circle, given what he's had to endure. Uh, and not only Jim, I mean, certainly he's the one that had to endure the sickness, go through all the hospital visits, hospitals, go through all the hospital visits, get good news, get bad news, think I'm getting better, now I have to go back to the emergency room. It was back and forth. If you didn't follow all of the postings that were going on in social media, it was quite the ordeal, to say the least. And whether she gets the credit or not, huge props go to Jan Berg. 
I, I guess what you would consider to be the single lifeline uh, for Jim to reconnect, to replug back in and say, hey, we're going to we're going to get over this. So stick around for the second hour. We'll be right back. And you are listening to BCRN, all barbecue and grilling all the time. Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. Boing. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine. How is long? <laughs> <laughs> we have a great show. I'm a big fan. Boing. So what? What? What seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead, and he's in the in the crackle. Charbono. It's all about the Charbono, dude. Succulent fish. What? He ate two for wiener. Oh, listen, Laverne, you have to shut your face. I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seed. <laughs> we have soft men working on it right now. Soft men. And just like that, we are into the second hour. Here we go. This is the Barbecue Central Show. Thanks for showing up. Appreciate you. If you missed the first hour of now, just relax. Of course, you know by now you can get this show right on the iTunes or Google Music. Is that what they call it? Google Play Music? I think it might just be Google Music. Thank goodness Google finally got on the native podcast app instead of having to use all the secondary stuff that you had to for years. They finally got native. So now you can just open Google Music and search BBQ Central Show, subscribe, and every Wednesday it'll show up. It's great. You never have to miss a second of the show ever again. Speaking of the show, still to come here this evening, Sam the Cooking Guy in about 13 minutes. And Jimmy Shotwell from Memphis Barbecue Supply. He's also the host. I don't know if host is the right thing to say or co-host. I don't want to be slighting anybody. And if Jimmy's the host, I, I don't want to slight him by saying there's a co-host. He's either host or co-host of the Rub, R-U-B, the Rub podcast. That's a barbecue and grilling related podcast. So you can check that one out in iTunes as well. I think it's on USA Today too through culinary, oh, What's the name of that? It's in Nashville. Uh, culinary. Well, whatever. I don't. We'll ask Jimmy about it. Okay, so who is taking part in the Green Mountain Grills online barbecue grill off? The first annual Green Mountain Grills competition. Winner getting a Daniel Boone Wi Fi enabled cooker. The good news, aside from getting that for free, is that is a unit that is adaptable to their new pizza insert, which I highly suggest. The entry period for ribs is closed. The entry period for pork is closed. We are now in poultry category. Entries must be submitted using the Facebooks, Instagrams, Twitter. Through your personal account, all entries must include not one, but two photos, one of the final plated presentation, and one showing the interior of the meat, which will allow judges to see the execution. I would tell you something about ribs, but that contest has already went through. Uh, you don't have to do all of them, by the way. So here's what you need. Aside from putting up on your social media channels, you have to hashtag GMG BBQ Grill Off. That's GMG BBQ Grill Off. And the category hashtags GMG Ribs, Pork, Poultry, Beef. GMG and then Ribs, Pork, Poultry, or Beef. Then you have to tag Green Mountain Grills account in the post on the Facebook and Instagram. So it's at Green Mountain Grills. On the Twitter, it's at GMG Grills. Then you need to name the dish and give a brief description. For example, for the pork, hashtag GMG grill off, hashtag GMG pork, at Green Mountain Grills, barbecue pulled pork sandwich. I seasoned it with my special pork rub, marinated in apple juice overnight, 
and slow cook it for eight hours. There you go. Again, we are in poultry division. So you, you can win a category, but if you don't cook all of them, then you really have no chance of winning, I guess. So if you just want the bragging rights, get in on that now. You have poultry running through December 10th, and then beef will be running December 10th through the end of the year, that being December 31st. That is the Green Mountain Grills online barbecue competition. Now, did you see this? A Barbecue Central Show exclusive news update. While I was diligently doing my job as Class 8 sales representative in Northeast Ohio for Allstate Peterbilt, which, by the way, were being sold to Ohio Caterpillar. That probably interests none of you, but we just found that out. I think it'll be a good thing. But nevertheless, as I was diligently doing my work as Class 8 sales guy in Northeast Ohio for Allstate Peterbilt, I saw an Instagram post that said, best barbecue show, best barbecue podcast, uh, best barbecue, well, whatever. Hold on. I don't usually dig into my phone for proper social media etiquette here, but I can get you the name. It is uh, best. Ba, ba, ba. Hold on. It's right here. Okay. On the Instagram, uh, yeah, best BBQ show. On the Instagrams at best barbecue, B A R B E C U E. And they are also a barbecue podcast. Here's what I see there are life cycles of barbecue podcasts, and it goes something like this. There is the Barbecue Central show, now going into its 12th year, something, 11th year, whatever it is. Then, there are all these new shows that fail. Get that big stuff out of here. Why is that? <laughs> I don't know. But we are now seeing a new run-up of Barbecue Podcasts. And I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that, uh, you know, in a year when everybody else has decided to give it up, <laughs> I will still be here giving you breaking news, having interviews with top men and women in the barbecue and grilling industry. Or I could be completely wrong. And uh, both the Rub and Best Barbecue Show will surpass me in popularity, original takes. Production value, blah, blah, blah. So those are the two that I'm listening to right now, actually. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I was doing my work, and I see on Instagram, best BBQ show or best barbecue show on Instagram is live on Instagram. So I whoop, pulled it right up. And uh, there was the host. His name is... You... Um, Yanni, Yoni, and there's also another guy, Stover. Those are your two co-hosts, I guess. Where, where do you think, by the way, it's more or less a Texas-based barbecue show because, you know, they're in Texas and it's a huge state and there's a F ton of barbecue restaurants in Texas. That's where the first barbecue editor position ever came to live, which was, of course, Daniel Vaughn of Texas Monthly. So this show is, I think the guys live in Austin, Texas, not too shabby of a place to live if you're going to do a barbecue podcast or Texas related. Where do you think they were this afternoon? Where do you think they were? Well, where does everybody go in Austin? Lined up at Franklin's Barbecue, back open. 
I'd actually picked out a news story to do right here in the 10 o'clock hour that said Franklin's Barbecue set to open this coming weekend. Because I got an email, as probably a number of you did, that subscribed to the Franklin Barbecue newsletter, that they were going to be closed Thanksgiving and Friday, but they were going to reopen Saturday and Sunday. They weren't going to be taking pre-orders for Thanksgiving week, but they do plan to resume pre-orders for the following week. While they are cooking outside, they will have a smaller cooking capacity, and they still will make the same amount of food for restaurant service, but a slightly smaller capacity for pre-orders. So again, if you didn't sign up or if you have not signed up for the Franklin Barbecue newsletter, and they don't send them out, annoyingly but i was like here i'm gonna help scoop the fact that franklin's is gonna be back open over the weekend taking thursday friday off for the holiday and they're gonna start cranking again saturday sunday there on out but no no they did it today it's a secret everybody and best barbecue show was there to break as it happened those dudes lined up started lining up at four in the morning. Four in the morning? There was talk of puppet shows on the street. Stover was slapping Yoni with his meat in the face or something along these lines. What? <laughs> Shenanigans and tomfoolery run amok. But in the end, they were second in line and got right in for some hot, fresh Franklin meat. Congratulations, boys. So Franklin's back open if you're down there. Okay, here you go. All right. The National Barbecue Association's 2015, 2016, 2017 barbecue tool of the year is the CHOPS Power Injector System. Comes in three awesome sizes to fit your injecting needs. You have the half gallon chops power injector system designed for competition folks or to pump up the backyard warrior like me and you. Easy to use, clean it, fill it, pump it, and away you go. If you have just one brisket or pork shoulder to do, you don't need to fill it all the way up. Just put in what you need, it uses it all. Comes with a whole mess of neato stuff. It's a hundred bucks. You gotta pay shipping on top of that. Then you have the one gallon chops power injector system for catering and bigger jobs. This holds double the amount of the half gallon. That's why they call it the one gallon. Some folks use it in Memphis and May style competitions because they're cooking a whole hog or maybe you're cooking 10 shoulders to get that perfect one. This one comes with the same cool mess of stuff. It's 120 bucks. You pay shipping on top of that. Then the CHOPS full power injector system. It's electric and is the commercial and competition big dad. There is not a holding tank this time, nay. A three and one half foot pickup tube you can put in any size container. From a few ounces to a 55 gallon drum, uh-huh. It was designed for Chef Rob at the best barbecue restaurant in Kansas City. We call that Q39 where I come from. He's said time and time again that with the Chops full power injector system, his briskets are better than ever. This one coming with crazy cool stuff. 325 bucks plus you pay shipping. A number of the top pitmasters in the world are using the CHOPS power injector system every day to make their barbecue better than the rest. Here's why. I mean, we live in a foodie world now. You can't deny it. We need flavor in every bite. This is how you do it and do it fast. Whole bunch of really cool accessories. If you want to shoot medium ground spices, they got you covered for that. I suggest you head on over to the website, barbecuekansascity.com. B-A-R-B-E-Q-U-E. B-A-R-B-E-Q-U-E. BarbecueKansasCity.com. That's BarbecueKansasCity.com. And hook up with the CHOPS Power Injector System. You're going to wonder how you ever inject it with a single needle. It will make no sense to you after you do it the first time with the CHOPS Power Injector System. Sam the Cooking Guy, out of the break. Stick around. Be right back. Show, giving you a monthly visit from a doctor of barbecue, a man actually named Meathead, the author of a barbecue bible, bloggers, reviewers, competitors, and manufacturers by the dozens. 
It's the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. This portion of the Barbecue Central Show is being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets for all of your pellet-driven cookers. Uh huh. Visit CookinPellets.com for more information. For more information or to purchase, or you can visit Amazon.com as well. You've heard of Amazon? Download the free Cooking Pellets app. And then you will be alerted when the best shipping prices happen. But if you don't want to wait, you can buy at Amazon.com or you can buy at CookinPellets.com. My first guest in the second hour is a multiple-time author, multiple-time Emmy. Oh, that's so unprofessional. Emmy award-winning TV show host, cooking class instructor, and the list goes on. Tonight, we are talking about the most taboo of subjects when it comes to Thanksgiving. The, oh, crap, I forgot Thanksgiving is Thursday. What am I going to do now? Subject. So let's head on over to the Smokin' with Smithfield hotline. And welcome back, friend of the show, Sam Zion. Sam, how are you, buddy? Sam. Greg. Hey, how are you? Good, man. He made it. What are you doing? Here he is. Sam, we're less than four. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. No? (laughs) (laughs) You're a fun guy, man. We're less. We share the same ridiculous sense of stern humor. I know. Um, We we know. I don't, uh, Sam, I don't know what you're talking about, okay? We got Thanksgiving coming up. I, I forgot my turkey. Um, no, really, we're 48 hours away from a Thanksgiving Day yeah. feast, potentially. Yeah, go go ahead. Talk to me. Talk and to it's me. the worst yeah. the possible problem? thing that could happen, right? People are coming. Expectations are running at a fevered pitch. And uh-oh, Isn't or it, it, I should say, uh-oh. I forgot to take my 20-pound it, turkey out of the freezer. What? Well, uh, what? Look, look, you can defrost. A, it's going to be a little tough. You can defrost <laughs> in water. It's it's a half an hour a pound. So what is that? Ten hours for a twenty pound turkey? Uh, yeah, give or take. But um, again, though, okay. let's make sure that. Uh, we, we like to make sure we're talking to the lowest common denominator. So when you're talking about defrosting in water, you're also uh, probably suggesting subliminally to continually change out the water to make sure it's cold and things of this nature. Yeah. So here's what you have to do. Think about a half an hour a pound. You have to change the water out every 30, 45 minutes. It's, it's going to be a hassle. There's no question about that. Yeah. And if you've got a 20-pound turkey and you don't realize you haven't done anything with it until Thursday morning, you're either eating late at night or you're not eating that that particular turkey at all. And, you know, we joke about it, but you you will 100% know there's people out there that are going to wake up Thursday morning and haven't really given it any thought because they haven't done it before. And the funny thing is I've cooked a million, a million. I mean, I've cooked a lot of Thanksgiving dinners. Yeah. I still have to remind myself every year what to do. It's not like making scrambled eggs that I do three times a week. It's not like you smoking the brisket twice a week. It's generally a once a once a year thing for most people. And you really have to get it in your head. You can't, you can't go wrong with a ridiculous amount of planning, but here we are really two days before people are having Thanksgiving dinner And people are going to wake up and they're going to be kind of screwed. So at that point, you have to reassess the whole thing. And I would say, look, if at that point you still want to do turkey, Mm. you've got a lot of options. Probably not a frozen turkey. You might be able to find yourself a fresh turkey at that point. But if you don't want to spend that money, right, maybe. But if you don't want to spend that money, then think about turkey parts. Think about turkey thighs or legs or turkey breasts or something which are easy to do. You know, the problem with Thanksgiving, and I I blame freaking Norman Rockwell for this, he painted that picture that has the the most perfectly cooked and gorgeously bronzed turkey sitting in the middle of the table, whole. I don't know any family 
in, in, the, in the past 10, 20, 30 years that brings the turkey to the table like that and father stands there and carves the turkey in front of everybody. It's done in the kitchen generally. And then if it's taken out to the table, it's taken out in a big platter. Right. Like looking beautiful. Look, don't get me wrong. I don't want it to look like crap. I want it to look good. So you carve it in the kitchen. You put it, you lay it out on a platter. You put some sage under one corner, some parsley under another. Maybe you scatter a little rosemary, some cranberries on top. You've got the legs positioned beautifully, the wings off to the side, the breast you've taken off whole and sliced. So if you screwed Thursday morning with no way to cook a whole turkey, I say you go buy some turkey thighs and turkey breast. And literally within a couple hours of throwing them in the oven for the, the biggest of that, which would be the turkey breast, you're done. And it's gorgeous. And you slice it. And you put it on a platter. And who gives a shit? Uh, do you buy you're into still, the— You're I th- still eating turkey. I think there is a certain percentage of the consuming public that really likes turkey the way it is. And then I think there's obviously another side, and I don't know percentages, that think turkey's bland and blah, and eh, I'm not really that big of a fan of turkey anyway, so it better be perfect, otherwise it's really going to suck. Where do you fall in on the flavor profile of turkey? I like turkey, but I also like what comes in the bite of turkey, which is some gravy, Mm. which is a a, a little stuffing. Sorry, there's a... uh, there's a plane from the military base going overhead. Jeez. You know what we call that here, Greg? We call that the sound of freedom. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, uh, you call it Tuesday night, I think, right? Tuesday night. Miramar. Uh, Miramar uh, Naval Air Station yeah. is, is right by here. Top gun, right? Uh, so, um, uh, top gun. Yep. Exactly right. Exactly right. So, I like turkey, but I do like gravy. And I like stuffing. And I like sweet potato or mashed potato or that kind of stuff. So I like a little bit in the bite. I could have turkey definitely more than once a year. Um, but my favorite part of, of Thanksgiving really are the leftovers. And I think I'm, I'm not alone in that. Yeah. A lot of people head in that direction. Like a, like a fr- Friday morning, a turkey Benedict will absolutely be an option in this house. As, as will. And wait, a turkey Benedict... Um, and not with hollandaise sauce, but with the gravy. Oh. And and so there will be stuffing, there will be turkey, there will be the poached egg, and there will be gravy on top and not hollandaise. And it will be freaking fantastic. As will be the turkey, mashed potato, stuffing, um, cake. Like a crab <laughs> cake. But but turkey stuffing mashed potato Oof. that has some sautéed bacon and mus- and uh, onions in it too, sautéed in a pan, crispy, a little olive oil, a little butter, crispy on both sides, on a plate with a with mm. a poached egg or an over easy egg or whatever you want on top of it. That to me is the best part of Thanksgiving, really. Are you but so? Are you a, are you a believer of multiple turkeys or just one big turkey to accommodate whoever you're having come over? We have uh, we have 16 people Thursday night. I I uh, I have a, a 20 pound uh, turkey oh. in my refrigerator wow. that I will be brining tomorrow night, uh, and uh, I'll be picking up a, a big roast beef that I will cook as along with it. <laughs> because Eaters. I like to do uh, I like to well like, it's nice to have you know a little something not. Uh, necessarily turkey. Mm-hmm. It's fun. So it, look, it's a, it's a it's a very festive time of year. It's it's my favorite food holiday. I like the cooking. I like waking up uh, Thursday morning. I, I'm doing. I'm going to the Fox Station here in San Diego. I need to be there at six o'clock to do their turkey hotline for an hour and a half. You know, people call in and go, well, "My turkey is frozen. What do I do? Or <laughs> how do I make gravy? Or what's the deal with it? You know, that kind of stuff." Yeah. So I'll do that. It's always fun to do. And then I'll come home, and um, probably Bloody Marys will be in order somewhere around 9 a.m., maybe maybe 9.30, maybe even 8.30. Or the Canadian version, which is made with uh, Clamato juice as opposed to tomato juice. Yeah. 
by the way, a really delicious, a really delicious changeup. And and for those that are thinking, oh shit, you know, clamato clam juice in a Bloody Mary sounds horrifying. Don't think it is. It's just it's just nothing but delicious and a nice little uh, nice little uh, difference. Do you do Michelada so, too? Like, do you do those? Micheladas? Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, that term brings two things to mind. One is just the lime juice version that we do in the summertime. Uh, a go- tall glass, ice, you know, maybe a third of it lime juice, and then a, a beer, you know, pr- preferably a Mexican beer poured on top. Or there's also the, what I would call a red beer, you know, tomato or clamato juice in with the beer and a little Worcestershire and some salt and some pepper and celery salt and hot sauce mixed in. Yeah, so we do we do both of those. But that term michelada kind of goes both ways, uh, you know, towards the lime version and also the, uh, the tomato-based mm. version. And they're both delicious. They both have a place. But But cooking in this kitchen Thursday morning will probably be – you know, some version of a Bloody Mary. But then it's just like, it's like, how can I put it? You know how every so often you'll see a commercial and someone will be standing on a street corner in New York and they've made the person stand completely still for like an hour <laughs> while, they, while the, the, the people walking around them is kind of sped up. That feels like me. I'm that person that's really calm in the middle and there's football being watched and there's things going on and people getting in arguments and having fun and playing games and, you know, monopoly, whatever. And the dogs are barking and the whole world's going past me and I'm just sipping on a bloody Mary in the kitchen and I'm making my stuffing and, you know, getting my roast beef going and to get the turkey out of the brine, that whole thing. When it's great. It's, a, it's the best food holiday there is. You had touched on the roast beef, so this ties in nicely to the to the next question. When you get to the point when, yeah. you know, thawing the frozen turkey is now no longer an yeah. option, if you can't get your hands on turkey parts for whatever reason, yeah. aside Go from ahead. a roast yeah. beef, what do you think are, I don't want to say acceptable things, but, like, what are some good things to make in lieu of the traditional Thanksgiving Day turkey? Mm. So you can always do chicken, right? I mean, chicken works. It completely works. I mean, look, if you're like 128% screwed, you could absolutely <laughs> go pick up like a deli roasted chicken at the supermarket and basically turn it into a turkey dinner in, you know, like a half an hour with very little work just by throwing sides at it and, and gravy. I would still probably make my own gravy because I think that stuff that comes in a jar, mm. that gelatinous, you know, stuff yeah. that comes in a jar is horrifying. Yeah. Horrifying. Terrorists make it. There's a, it's exactly right. <laughs> I, I feel the same. Right. <laughs> you can make really good gravy without a whole lot of effort. There's, but there's a recipe on my website. You, you take a quart of chicken stock or, or, or chicken broth or turkey broth or whatever, if you can find it. And you start it simmering in a little pot, and you put in some rosemary, some thyme, some sage, and a bay leaf. You know, wrap it together with string, or just throw the stuff in and let it reduce by half. It'll just help the flavors concentrate. And then in another little pan, you make a roux. Tablespoon of uh, butter, it melts, sprinkle a tablespoon of flour, stir it in, let it uh, sort of do its thing for a couple minutes. Uh, then you add this this broth in, and uh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Also, in the 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 chicken stock or broth, whatever you've got with the herbs, you put in a quarter cup of white wine, or I keep vermouth in my pantry because vermouth is is a fortified alcohol. Yep. You open the lid, you close it. It's good today. It's good tomorrow. It's good three months from now. Unlike a bottle of white wine, it's going to go shitty in it, you know, a couple of days. Right. So you've got this, you know, this vermouth in this, the whole thing reduces, and then you put it in the pan that's got this roux. We all know what a roux is, or we should. Yep. It's just a thickening agent. It's the butter that's melted with the flour in it, and you start, you know, slowly incorporating this broth, and it just becomes magic. 
it becomes, I'm telling you, it's magic. It's delicious and it's thick and it's rich. And then you season it with a little salt and pepper. I put garlic powder in, which doesn't make it garlicky. It just makes it better. And a tablespoon or so of either soy sauce or Worcestershire. Mm. And you've got some damn fine gravy that I'm telling you will dress up any store-bought deli roasted chicken that you're going to find. Here's something that's happened to me. Do, go ahead. Yeah, go go ahead. ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. No. I'm, I'm going somewhere else. I, I got nothing. No, no, no. Right. I got nothing. Here's something that's happened to me over the course of the year. During one yeah. of our past segments, we had talked about how, for whatever reason, turkey isn't really made outside of Thanksgiving, maybe Christmas. Right. Uh, so maybe yeah. twice a year, let's say, at the most. But for me, with the influx of barbecue restaurants that are actually hitting the Cleveland area over the last year or so, while my preparation of turkeys hasn't really gone up dramatically, yeah. my consumption yeah, sure. of turkey has gone up dramatically because most wow. of the barbecue places that are coming into town have that or want to achieve that Texas style. And, of course, Texas style does mean turkey in some degree, form, or fashion. So I'm eating a lot more turkey than I've ever eaten in the last 20 <laughs> years. Over, I've, I've eaten double that in the last year or so because of the, the really good barbecue places that have showed up here in Cleveland. Are you finding any of that to be the same for you or in your uh, area or what? You know, I, I haven't. But I have to tell you, I'm, I'm thrilled that that's the case. Yeah. And I don't know, is that, is, that, is that venturing out for these barbecue places? I mean, like, how, how long has turkey been a standard, or has it? Yeah, I think it's been now, you know, when you start getting into the minutia of, yeah. is that a Carolina thing? No. Is it a Kansas City thing? Eh, kind of. Texas, absolutely. I mean, the, I think the most widely considered greatest turkey happens to come from the guy that serves the best brisket in Texas, that being Aaron Franklin and Franklin's Barbecue. Franklin. So, yeah, I mean. You're and, kidding. I no, didn't know he yeah. did turkey. Oh, yes. And what, and what is the, and, and what form does it take? It's turkey breast. I mean, it's, he does a breast. Yeah. There's he's, a, just, he's smoking breast. Is that what he's doing? Yes. There's a, a restaurant and in he, Cleveland he, called he, The Proper Pig. And uh, the editor for yeah. Texas Monthly's barbecue, uh, the barbecue editor came up to Cleveland. He's originally from the Ohio area. And he reviewed Proper Pig with me in tow and looked at me after his first bite and he said, yeah. this is as good as Franklin's, as good as Franklin barbecues turkey. So there, there is legitimate barbecue turkey to be had here in Cleveland. And I can enjoy it as much as I want now where I was just eating my turkey once a year or so. And think about how, I mean, look, if you want, I, I, I'm not going to get preachy, but clearly, I mean, maybe barbecue ain't the, it, it, not the best food you could eat, right? Right. There's a lot of fat, yes. pork, the whole, I mean, the whole thing, right? Yes. Turkey gives you like a really sort of get your, get your smoke on, but do it in a slightly better way. I mean. I'm looking at the Proper Pigs website right now, and there's there's uh, smoked turkey as a sandwich. There's yep. you can get uh, smoked turkey breast by the half pound. Yes, that's what we get. What it, it comes in a you get it, I think in probably a combo platter. I mean, it's amazing. Of course, you could also get bacon on a stick for five bucks. This might discount might discount what you're doing with the turkey benefit, <laughs> but but no, I love that. I had no idea. Yeah. And as much as I, I've never been to Franklin, I've certainly read and seen enough stuff, but they never talk about that. They only ever talk about the, the classic, you know. The brisket. Uh, rib. Yeah. Brisket, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. The brisket's really the thing that they talk about there. But, so, tie, tie it up for me here in the next couple minutes about uh, Thanksgiving yeah. and anything else that we want to take into consideration to make sure we're pulling it off. And uh, winning the year, I, I would do this. I mean, look, I, I've been saying this to people for the past couple of weeks. I don't care what your level is in the in the kitchen. I think this is the time that you go for it. You have to try. 
the worst thing that happens when you F up a meal is that you eat it. It's not like painting a picture that's like disgusting and then you just throw it out. <laughs> when I screw up something in the kitchen, which I've done plenty of times, I eat it. I might not love it, but it's there and it's what my food was going to be, that lunch, that dinner, that practice session, whatever it is, yeah. and I'm going to eat it. And I want pe- the only way people get better is by doing. My, my third cookbook, uh, The Grilling One, the intro that I wrote says, um, cooking is like riding a bike. The more you do it, the better you get. Well, look, the reality is anything is like that, you know? An accountant is better after he has practice, right? We all rode a bike in the beginning. We fell off and we hurt our arms or our knees or our butts or whatever. Mm-hmm. But now we can all ride bikes. And the reason is, is practice. So you're not going to get better at making a turkey or gravy or stuffing or mashed potatoes or, or pecan pie or anything by not trying it. So if you're an amateur and you're not comfortable or you're only used to grilling or using a barbecue or a smoker, which I mean a big part of your, your audience are people that love to do that stuff and God bless them. Right. But maybe the inside kitchen is not their thing. And I say, more men should get inside and more women should get outside. I love women that can grill. I love women that love barbecue yeah. and want to get their hands in there and do it. And then there's, you know, I, I, I go to a, an event. I talk to couples all the time and I say, who cooks? And, there, and I won't say it's the standard answer, but 30%, at least 30, 40% of the time, the man will say, well, I, I do the grilling and the barbecue and stuff like that. <laughs> right. And the woman says, yeah, I do everything inside. And I say, it's enough of that. That change reverse roles. I'm not asking you to change clothing. Right. I'm saying <laughs> there's look. Most kitchens of restaurants are run by men. Yes, that's changing a lot. Yeah. But men belong inside as well as women belong outside. So this Thanksgiving, if you're listening and you don't have a plane to do something yourself, you're just going to go out this effort and let's just go out. And we'll find something. I say take a stab at it because. Until you make that first step towards that turkey or that stuffing or whatever it is, you're not going to get better unless you do it. And if you, if you take a pass on it this year, next year, there's a good chance you're going to take that pass too. Agreed. For great I recipes. Hate whole Foods. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Look, uh, you can go to a Whole Foods or a Pig and Whistle or a Smart Mart or whatever and get a whole dinner done. You want to do that fast? Okay, but at least try a couple of the things yourself. That's all I have to say. For recipes to try things for yourself, for women to either get outside or men oh. to get inside or do it together. I mean, why not make a whole date night out of it? Start inside, end up outside, That's and then I who say. knows where you're going to end up. together, man. Right. Uh, Thecookingguy.com is the website. You, hope you're gonna, you know where you hope you're going to end up. That's but. right, right in front of the TV. What? <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> Thecookingguy.com exactly right. the is the website for Sam yeah. Zion. He is Sam the Cooking Guy. And I uh, always appreciate the time, Sam. Thanks so much. Thanks, man. Have a good night. You got it. There he is. Yeah. Sam Zion, Sam the Cooking Guy. Oh, yes, on the Barbecue Central show. And he's saying, hey, the Smithfield get, Hotline. Yummy. get in the kitchen, men. Women, get outside. Let's do this thing. Yeah, I agree. Let's do this thing. Jimmy Shotwell coming up out of the break. I'm going to talk to you quickly about Butcher's Barbecue. Certainly, we know that Butcher's carries a great selection of barbecue products. The injections, of course, all the rubs and the marinades. Did you know that the injections now come? Dave has taken the possible stupid quotient right out of the injection it's already made pre-made beef and pork injections in bottles all you have to do is go buy them pour them out get your syringe pull out the injection and then inject easy you don't even have to follow directions anymore on how to mix a liquid and a powder mix it all together and what you need no 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 it's too complicated Oh, boy, it's too complicated. This butcher barbecue's a jetchin'. So, Dave has 
as I was just talking with Sam, taking it down to the lowest common denominator. He's done all of the work, bottled it for beef, bottled it for pork, ready for you to buy, pour out, and then inject. Very easy to do. As I had mentioned, the sauces, the rubs, you know it. The grilling oil, I absolutely love. If you're going to be doing a turkey tomorrow or Thursday or both days or into Friday, who knows? Turkey's all over the place this coming week over the next three, four, five days. Butter-flavored grilling oil on the skin of the turkey. <laughs> Come on. It's going to crisp up really nice. Lastly, dealers wanted, if you currently own a barbecue and grilling supply store and you don't carry Butcher Barbecue products, what are you waiting for? Hit up ButcherBBQ.com. Request information on how to become a dealer for them today. Not only will Dave thank you, but your customers will reap the rewards by getting these fine products in their hands to try for themselves. These products are extensively tested both in the backyard and on the competition trail, so you know they are going to deliver the goods. Head on over to ButcherBBQ.com and check out all their products. You'll be happy that you did. Butcher's Barbecue. Always trust your butcher. Jimmy Shotwell coming up. Stick around. Be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. All right, as I mentioned in the first hour, the 2018 grant program is closed. However, the 2018 Committed Cooks program will be ready to jump here in the next couple weeks. So, A, stay tuned here on this show for any new releases of information that I can give you via Smithfield. Otherwise, hit up their website, Smokin, S-M-O-K-I-N, Smokin with Smithfield.com. You'll be able to stay in tune with everything that's happening. All right, helping me close the show tonight, a competitive barbecue cook. He also owns Memphis Barbecue Supply, which also happens to be the team name as well in Bartlett, Tennessee. Last week, he competed in the barbecue side of things at the World Food Championships. Here to give his take on the event and co-host or host of the Rub Podcast, Jimmy Shotwell. Jimmy, how are you, buddy? Greg, don't now see me. How are you doing tonight? Absolutely wonderful, Jimmy. Appreciate you making time for the show here. So let me get it right. Uh, are you host of the Rub Podcast or is Forrest a co-host or a uh, mediator, or like what's the official chains of command here? Um, he's the co-host with me. He's producer, editor, makes me sound somewhat decent on the radio. <laughs> and he also is the keeper of all the bloopers. Uh, and Lord, there's oh. so many. Uh, I've got to say, hey, you doing the ears live is wonderful. I don't think I could do that because <laughs> that's where edit button is for. Yes, that's why I love doing Meatheads podcast too. Because it's all just recorded, and then I can go back in. And it's funny how everybody can sound like a million bucks after you spend an hour or two on editing, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, that's, that's what that's what Force gets paid big bucks for, and I get paid uh, nothing. That's right. Uh, Jimmy Shotwell joining me here on the show. Uh, Jimmy, before we get into the WFC recap, if this is your first time on the show, of course. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you got into barbecue, A, on the competition side, and then into the business of barbecue with Memphis Barbecue Supply Store. Well, yeah, kind of give you an overview. I grew up in a household that was kind of crazy. I grew up in a bed and breakfast. So <laughs> um, people coming in and out of the house all the time, wonderful food you cooked. Uh, and it was just a growing up in that experience being around food all my life. Well, I got a scholarship to University of Memphis. I came to Memphis and experienced real barbecue uh, for the first time down here, and it was an eye-opening experience, and I was hooked. Uh, and I haven't left Memphis since. And uh, started just dabbling uh, in competition barbecue. We had quite a few friends who had teams at Memphis in May. They needed someone to take out the trash, and they had an open bar, so that was a perfect <laughs> fit. Uh, then one thing left to another, someone dropped out one year, and uh, they needed someone to cook an ancillary category, and I was just hooked from there on. Uh, that's how I got in the competitive side. And uh, so cooking's always been part of my life, but uh, competitive cooking probably like the last 15, 20 years, uh, cooking competitively. What about on the business side with Memphis Barbecue Supply? Well, I uh, – I was a district sales manager for a roofing manufacturer, so totally not in the barbecue industry. Uh, but states I would travel through, like Missouri, 
I'll go to Kansas City and see stores like Memphis Barbecue Supply up there. And I would come back home to Memphis. We had nothing here. Uh, there wasn't even a, a fireplace store that really had stuff that you could get uh, here in Memphis. And that just kind of pissed me off that I had to go to Kansas City and St. Louis to get the supplies I needed to go to two competitive competition because uh, I was really wanting to get to going. Well, got married, got a wonderful wife, and then at that point, uh, a newborn kid, and I was, okay, time to get off the road, time to find something here in Memphis to do. And, uh, Decided, hey, I'm going to open my own, my own little small business. Uh, <laughs> many gray hairs, and four years later, here we are. So, are you? Is Memphis Barbecue Supply successful in your eyes? I mean, are you the go-to place for the backyard guy, the competition guy, and everything in between? Yeah, that was interesting. When we first opened. We were kind of tailored more to the competition guys. Uh, the locally in the mid south area, so the MBN, the Memphis Barbecue Network, mm -hmm. uh, was kind of what our focus was on. Memphis in May, uh, we've kind of grown since then. But the eye opening experience was the backyarders uh, started to come in the store and find the products: the Blues Hog, uh, the Big Papa, the the Plowboys Yardbird, which we all know and love. Yep. But they had the scene down here, um, and we started doing classes. We do free classes at the store at least one a month. For coming from the backyard folks, doing how to do steak, how to do chicken, how to do your first rack of ribs, how to do butts, and they're free classes. And this backyard, fifty-year-old guys, twenty-year-old women who are in there taking these classes and learn how to use that smoker in the grill for the first time. And uh, that's what our business kind of is now. It's geared more towards the backyarders, the king of the cul-de-sac, um, but we still also take care of our comp guys. All right, Jimmy, so last week or so you were down in Alabama cooking World Food Championships. How did you qualify for the event, first off? Um, didn't qualify. We were uh, part of KCBS since it's a KCBS event. They have to have a certain number of spaces open uh -huh. um, so anybody can register for. Uh, we went two years ago, loved it, uh, and I told the business partner, hey, win, lose, or draw, we need to go down there, have fun, exposure. Uh, and then we've got the podcast, and I was talking to Forces like, we need to go anyways just to cover it because we got a lot of folks from the Mid South and Memphis area who've been cooking there, not just barbecue, but the other categories. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how we got kind of hooked up in that. And uh, last year was a wonderful time. The weather was great. I mean, <laughs> you've got a barbecue contest, and less than a half a mile away, you've got <laughs> white sandy beaches. You, you can't beat that. Uh, did you? Double header it, or did you just cook uh, IBC or KCBS? Oh, uh, we did everything. It was a crazy man. We did uh, the ancillaries on Thursday. Um, we did um, the ICBA, first time I've ever done one of those. And then we did the KCBS on Saturday. So it was basically three days of cooking, about 15 hours of cooking, and about three hours sleep each night. Um, so yeah, I won't probably do that next year. How did you <laughs> find? How did you find the IBCA um, competition itself? Did you like? Uh, I know they kind of you know changed it up a little bit. Traditional IBCA is going to have chicken ribs and brisket, and they added a fourth category in there. But just overall, what did you think of the turn-ins there versus what you're used to? Pluses and minuses. We had to overcook everything because they want a fork and knife, be able to cut into everything. And then everything we were talking to our customers, some of our vendors who have cut, cooked some of those contests, they were telling us to overcook and make everything super tender mm. for it. So that kind of threw us for a little loop. Um, the turn-in times, you had that hour and a half between each turn-in. That was – I thought at first, I was like, man, this is going to be great. Then when we got out there cooking, I was sitting going – an hour and a half? Come on, dude. Let's let's roll with this. <laughs> let's go with the next one. Uh, it was nice to have that break in between each turn in, but an hour would have been great. An hour and a half is just a little too much. The one thing I did not like, um, no scores. At the end of the contest, I was thinking that we would possibly get a score sheet on Friday night to kind of give us an idea of how we were stacked up against mm -hmm. everybody. So if we need to change anything or dial something in or tighten up, we could turn around on Saturday and do that. Uh, for the KCBS, but uh, uh, unless you made the final table, you got no feedback, no scores whatsoever. Um, so that was kind of, I'm like, okay, SCA does the exact same thing. They give you a ticket when you turn in your box. Mm -hmm. And SCA, State Cookoff Association, you actually get your scores back if you place dead-ass last or if you place first. 
And that kind of thing for a loop, okay, if you're going to have this content, you've got to figure out some kind of way to get scores back to the teams so they can kind of figure out how they can improve or what they need to change, was it the tenderness, was it the taste, uh, was it the appearance, or what, what was what was the deal there? Jimmy Shotwell joining me here on the show from Memphis Barbecue Supply, also co-host of the Rub Podcast, which you can get on iTunes and various other locations. Jimmy, there have been multiple accounts from some of my most trusted sources that there was quite a dust-up during the Cooks meeting that related to rules and how top 10 were going to be chosen. It was either assumed or told one way, and then all of a sudden in the meeting it was changed up a different way, then it changed back again. How did you find that, or what What can you tell me about that? <laughs> I had a front-row seat to that. When I say I had a front-row seat, I'm, I'm the nerd of the class, so I sat in the front row literally uh, at <laughs> the Cooks meeting. Uh, and it was at the first Cooks meeting. There was two Cooks meetings, an IBCA, and there was a KCBS. Uh, at the first Cooks meeting, uh, Mike McLeod comes in there, welcomes everybody, uh, and then he drops the bombshell. Uh, if you're a KCBS team and you place top five in I- IBCA, um, you're not getting, you're not going into Sunday. You've got to win the category that you cook in. If you're a KCBS team, KCBS, for example. And in the rule book they sent out to everybody, it didn't specify that. It said, just top five from this contest, we move on. Top five from this contest, we move on. It didn't say the top five KCBS team has to place top five in KCBS, mm-hmm. which I, I understand why they were doing that. They wanted the best teams at KCBS versus the IBCA, because that's how they build it was this circuit versus this circuit. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't really spelled out in the front end. So at that meeting, you had a lot of uproar from the teams going, okay, well, dude, I, I cook both, or I predominantly cook four here and three here, so which one am I? Um, and, and he said the reps will, make, will tell me, hey, this team is predominantly a KCBS team. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> Okay, that's kind of so. So I just wasted two hundred dollars to to enter this contest, and the best I can do is maybe win some prize money, but as a guarantee me a slot on Sunday. So that was kind of the mentality some of these teams had, and uh, they were a little a little missed. In fact, there was quite a few teams that were standing up going, "I want a refund." Um, mm. Well, in between that meeting, uh, the Cooks meeting, and the second Cooks meeting, which the KCBS. Um, I might, I guess, had talked to the reps or whatnot, and they changed it and went, okay, dude, just if you place top five in which category, whichever, uh, you're going to move on to Sunday. And that's like Booty Q, who uh, from down there in Alabama, he's a probably KCBS team. Yes. He placed top five on Friday uh, and then moved on into Sunday. So he didn't really have to cook the KCBS contest. He did, but he didn't have to. Um, so he's qualified and moved on and whatnot. But they, they finally changed their mind and went, okay, yeah, we're going to let just the top five in each category win it. So if he would have been top five in both, would he have been removed from the KCBS side and it trickle down to the next guy? From my understanding, if, if, you, if, if you place like fifth in one contest and first in the other, um, whichever one you placed higher in would have been the, the – circuit you would have represented Mm -hmm. but whoever six would have moved up to your slot uh in the other one so i mean do you think that there's a potential issue where you have guys that are predominantly icba who see a patrick banks of booty q representing ibca and they know full well that this guy does 99 percent kcbs competitions he's not representing ibca and that's what Mike McLeod was trying to do. That's what their, their thought process they were trying to do. It's unfortunately, it wasn't communicated to the teams <laughs> in a timely manner ahead yeah. of time before, hey, here's a Cooks meeting, and you need to start getting your meat ready. Because, uh, I mean, I showed up with uh, all my meat prepped, vacuum sealed, ready to go, and spent X number of dollars on entry fee plus uh, the meat. And had I known that, honestly, I don't know if I would have cooked both or just cook KCBS. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it would just been a toss up. But um, I think what they did this year was good. Now next year, it will probably be spelled out in bold lettering with underlined and all that fun stuff in italics that uh, uh, how they're going to lay it out next year. Do you think that they will still keep it as dual sanctioning bodies? Or do you think that there will be an emergence of a World Food Championships judging scale that will be all inclusive? 
Actually, it was mentioned, and Mike mentioned this at the Cook's meeting, so I can I don't know, nobody told me this in confidence or secret or anything. Uh, at the Cook's meeting, at the IVCA uh, meeting when he was up there, he mentioned possibly next year adding a third sanctioning body. Mm-hmm. So you'll be cooking barbecue then on Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday. Um, the, the sanctioning body he mentioned was the Memphis Barbecue Network. Um, so I don't know if, it's, if he's serious about that because if he is, it's going to be whole hog, shoulder, and ribs. And then Friday doing the, the uh, IBCA and the Saturday at KCBS, and someone's going to be in the hospital with lack of sleep. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. But So in the top 10 category, this was – uh, hour and a half or two hour time frame uh, from all accounts it was surf and turf kind of a of an affair in your opinion jimmy do you think that the top 10 setup or category or turn-ins was a good way of determining who was the best barbecue cook not really i mean it's it's kind of a free-for-all you've got an hour and a half so first off you've got a clock that you're, you're kind of like up against which is good, but hey, we're talking barbecue. Barbecue's low and slow. Yeah. So an hour and a half, what can you knock out? You can knock out some pork tenderloin. You can do a beef, something or another. Uh, you can do uh, Cornish hens. You can do some chicken, maybe an hour and a half, but some fish. But what what exactly can you do in an hour and a half that's going to knock? somebody's socks off and be barbecue so that's my first issue with it It needs to be a little bit longer it needs to be at least a three to four hour window Uh, and then it's kind of really arbitrary of of how they're scoring it it's the eat system which how everything else the steak the burgers seafood's all judged by that but it's kind of a different mindset when you look at a barbecue um the eat is an acronym stands for execution, appearance, and taste, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, and you got to give them a recipe card, or, hey, this is what our goal is to make you, and then you show it. I, I'm kind of a little leery about that, but it was basically a free-for-all, hour and a half, do a surf and turf like you talked about, and best foo-foo presentation and turn it in. Jimmy Shotwell is the owner of Memphis Barbecue Supply, the pitmaster of Memphis Barbecue Supply as well, and host of the Rub Podcast, which you can find on iTunes and various other iTunes, I mean, uh, podcast directories. Uh, Jimmy, I'm out of time, but we'll talk about why the Barbecue Hall of Fame should be placed in Memphis next time. Uh, so get your notes ready to talk on that hot point. Man, I just have all these notes sitting here. I came prepped, <laughs> ready to go. Uh, I even showed up sober, man. Come on, it's nine. It's almost ten o'clock. I hear you. Well, you know, this is what they say: good first impression means another time uh, and, and another segment, my friend. And I appreciate the time. Greg, thank you for having me on board, and I look forward to talking again. We'll have you back on the uh, podcast uh, soon. Uh, actually, we're going to end season one here in about two weeks. All right, and then we'll kick off season two next year, right there in February, and we'll we'll get you right there in with us. All right, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Greg. Take care. There he is, Jimmy Shotwell, Memphis Barbecue Supply. Really good first effort there from Jimmy. See what happens. I, I want to know about these guys. We asked the background, you know, get to know you, get the central lights ingratiated a little bit. Then we run out of time when I want to ask him about why the Barbecue Hall of Fame should be put in Memphis. But, hey, I know he's got a dissertation ready to lay out for the central lights, so... Looking forward to that next conversation. Right now, head on over to Big Papa Smokers to take care of all your barbecue needs. Big Papa is the one-stop online shop for all things barbecue. Their curated selection of only the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies will get you on the path to making better barbecue. Everything that is on sale is hand-approved by Big Papa himself. The award-winning rub, sauces, American-made grills, and smokers. Big Papa has everything you need to make your outdoor cooking better. Whether you're in the backyard or a competition pro, Big Papa Smokers has something for you. If you're looking to improve the flavor of your competition recipe, Big Papa's has combined forces with fellow rub company Simply Marvelous Barbecue to form what is now known as the West Coast Offense. They also are the proud owner of Granny's award-winning barbecue sauce. Looking for a new go-to sauce that pleases everyone? Granny's traditional yet powerful flavor reminds us why we fell in love with barbecue in the first place. Find Granny's barbecue sauce and other top-rated barbecue sauces at www.bigpapasmokers.com. 
Are you looking for a versatile smoker that's easy to use? Of course you are. Check out the Mac 2 Star General Pellet Grill. Big Papa's the only exclusive Mac dealer, and they offer special packages to boot. If you're not a fan of pellet poopers, take a look at the Old Hickory Ace BP. It's the only charcoal cooker that fits on the back of Big Papa's competition trailer. By the way, if you're just a backyard hack like me and you're looking for a durable and versatile grill that lasts forever, the M Grill, Amazon Mike, is from Texas, and it's just what you need. They're built like tanks. If you're not sure of what grill you need, call for consultation, 877-828-0727. Shop their website, BigPapaSmokers.com. That's B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A Smokers.com. All right, we are wrapping the show. When we come back, stick around. We will be right back. Whole packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injecting butts. You've never heard this before. You might think you found the best triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Craig Rimpey. All right, thanks again to Jimmy Shotwell for joining me this past segment. And we will go ahead and, all right, Huck Jr., we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. All the way back in the first hour, we talked with Stephen Reichlin, reprising his third Tuesday of the month role here on this show. We talked extensively about his time in Italy. And if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> sounds like he's going to go back in the spring for season two of Stephen Reichlin Grills Italy. Eel. I was going to ask him about uh, horse meat, but I, I didn't get to it. They eat horse meat in Italy. I know that. Then we talked with Jim Berg. He has reclimbed the mountain to grand champion Chippetness, Cummins, Georgia at uh, Contest B. Congratulations to Jim and Jan on another grand championship and getting back, coming all the way back there from the sickness. Then the second hour, Sam Zion, Sam the Cooking Guy, thecookingguy.com. Hit, hit up for recipes right now. If you're still looking for something to do for Thursday or you need help or a last minute idea, tip or trick, thecookingguy.com is the place to go. Jimmy Shotwell joined me as we close the show. M, like Mike, mbbqsupply.com is his website, mbbqsupply.com. Team name of uh, the Saint and Memphis Barbecue Supply and host of the Rub Podcast. Big show lined up for next week. You can believe that. Until then, this is your program host and proud U.S. American. Whoop, whoop. Let me reverse that. Big show lined up for next Tuesday. You can believe that. September 11th, 2001. I will never forget until next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Happy Thanksgiving and good night now. Good night now.